All right, let's try that again. Good evening, folks. Uh, to those of you on YouTube, we just had some connectivity issues. Uh, but we're back. We're back. We're back. Back. We're on wire this time, and it should be fine. So, can my lovely folks in the chat let me know if this is up? Uh, I better just tell them I'm back up. So, let's see. Great. Wonderful. Up and running. Excellent. If, um, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, like, uh, if you can just let the others know in the chat to, say, refresh the page if I've not come back up, because I am live now. All right, so we are going to carry on looking at um, that little 2D engine uh, we made last year uh, through the guise of there were two Game Jam entries that were thrown out, um, which were very, well, lots of parts were very hacky or again, went against the model we had originally conceived. So we're going to dive into those this week, the two games themselves. And look at the places where things don't quite lo don't quite line up. Make some notes. Have some thoughts. I would really I love your um, up and yelling. Yes, always. Um, yeah, really appreciate your thoughts on where we could take this. Um, and the the answer might be the the design we've chosen is impractical, and we should stop it. And that's completely fine. It's just we were doing an experiment, so we want to see where it goes. Before we do that, though. Um, Tiny update on the data processing language stuff that I'm working on. That's the thing that's going to take us back towards doing SIMD things. Hey, Jace, good to see you, man. Um, we have... I've got the first part of the um, traits system for that language working. Now, I'm not completely satisfied with it yet as well. I'm not really satisfied with the generic traits implementation I've got. So I need to test that and really see if it's going to work. Um, but this is the general idea. So here is a trait um, that that you implement if you want to be addable. Um, the function that belongs to this trait, or you can have a number of functions that you have to implement to be to satisfy this trait, but this trait only need, requires one function, um, and it's the one it's going to use for plus. So whenever um, someone writes plus, for that, um, depending on the type that's passed to it, it's going to expect that type to implement the addable trait, and then it's going to look up the appropriate function for that. So here we're saying the function is an unknown um, like the, these types are all the same because they've got the same name, question mark A, question mark A, question mark A. This would be two different types, A and B returning A. Um, and yes, yeah, so you have to provide this. So to show an implementation, if I just go into, um, let's see, floating point. So here you can see I've got this define dummy function. This is because right now I don't have the um, I just need something to tell the type system. Yes, there's a function here. Um, it's called this. This is what its type is. Um, later on, this is going to be backed by various kind of implementations, whether it just be uh, the regular like plus from common Lisp, if we're compiling down to just a kind of optimized Lisp form, um, or it might be the SIMD add, depending on what we're doing and things like this. So Yes, we'll have to have a look at this. But for right now, it just defines a dummy function so the system knows what to use. And then you can see down here, this is how we implement a trait. So you define a trait implementation. I say I want to implement addable for this type, which is float 32-bit uh, float. And you say to satisfy uh, addable, um, my implementation of add is f32 add, um, which you can see here. And you can see that the types are going to line up uh, with this. And then that means that if you do come back to that in a second, uh, plus 1.2, uh, 3.2, whatever. Uh, we can see that when it compiled, it's fun calling um, the function f32+, plus, which is the one we specified um, when we're saying how to satisfy addable. So we use plus, we get f32+, plus. we can see the other constants here, and this is just um, the kind of type annotated um, and slightly optimized. It's gone through a few compile uh, through a few optimization passes um, version of what we wrote here. Um, this will obviously get much more extensive. Uh, when I got that working the other day, I also wanted to get a top-level function inlining. Um, so let's have a look. If we go into vectors, basically as soon as I got traits, I could start sketching out what a standard library might look like. And I've, all I've done so far is like the basic types and a vector type so I could start working. So here we can see a, a definition of a record. It's got X, Y, and Z. They're all 32-bit uh, floats. And then we've got implementations of like vector add, for example, vector subtract, all the things you would expect. 
and then the implementation of addable again. Hey, if I'm a vector three, um, I satisfy addable by um, using vec3 plus um, for plus. And that's really it. Uh, so this stuff is all type checked and all that kind of thing. Um, defin is actually remembers the um, resulting source code as well. So those functions can actually be inlined. Um, da, da, da. So, and then further down here, we've got kind of component wise adds and divides, uh, dot products and all that kind of stuff. So then I can come up here and say, hey, I want to do a dot product of the sum of these two vector threes and this vector three, and we do this. There's quite a bit of code here um, because of the function inlining. And the reason we're doing all that inlining is because later on we're going to, well, there's a few things. First, we're going to be converting this to all to SIMD code, so we're going to have this kind of straight through kind of execution. Um, and we're going to, like, I have been wanting to play with optimizing um, compilers, so I really just wanted to, like, inline stuff, and let's just see how much we could do. So there's probably a bunch of things in here um, that could end up being optimized, especially there's probably some, there will, there will be um, some common sub-expressions in here. Probably, like, if I just pick one of these, I'm just kind of expecting that... Or maybe it isn't in this particular case. We can easily come up with one. Right now, the compiler is very dumb. So if you did um, add together minus one, two, and minus one, two, it will crash because what? Oh, yeah, we got vec3 dot product. Yeah, I should have actually looked at the error, which tells us that um, incorrect args and function call expected two. Oh yeah, for dot product. Yeah, it didn't even get to the point it was complaining about the types. So yes, yeah, so you can see here that we've got two identical subtractions here. So this is going to be the same value regardless of what... The, at the moment, we've got constants in there, but they could be variables. If the two forms are exactly the same, they're going to result in the same value. We don't have side effects in this little language. So we could eliminate these common sub-expressions, as they're called. Am I air quote there, they are common sub-expressions. So that's one of the passes we need to add is common sub-expression elimination. We're going to take records, we're going to do record destructuring, all kinds of things, but that is for the future. And today um, we are messing around with little games. So actually what I need to do, or I want to do at least, is we're going to um, bring up the game just because, not because we're going to be playing it so much, just because it's nice to have something over here. So if you do make the mistake of looking at me, you can at least distract yourself with something better. Right. Da, 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 da. Oh, yes, here we go. So this is the things we reviewed from last week. So some of the things we saw immediately, so we clearly need some global ro rotation um, stuff because everything's local so far, and we just there's too many cases where we're needing it. Um, some naming is crap, but that's fine. Uh, Oh yeah, the, some of the um, the depth setter and getter are absolute, um, which is again we've been most of the time we've been talking about uh, relative positions, relative to rotations and stuff. Uh, timers seem like to seem like they're some kind of global resource. We should probably do something about those. There's something that doesn't fit right now. We also saw that um, when we used let's have a look. Let's bring up the code again. Peace. Um, we also have define audio, which was hacked in during that week. So clearly there are other top level resources that we're interested in. Um, scale is absolute. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not. Um, probably is okay. Because if you're talking about yourself, you probably know that. I'm not sure. Because um, you're saying, no, it's not absolute. Is it? Well, it's, it's, yeah, that's probably not correct then. Because you're saying 50%. If you, hmm, yes, we'll actually have to see how that's implemented. Um, Position between and offset two um, when necessary for bone chat, but don't fit our model. Okay, yeah, this was um, getting relative um, distances between um, different actors and things like this, um, and it like it doesn't fit in a model as it is now. It might have to be how things work. This is really where we need to get to, but we need some more data, so that's what we're going to be going through here. So let's go and check on chat and see what's going through. Up and yelling, yeah! Right. <laughs> um, 
Prompted him saying traits or concerns are cool, but can introduce many small pieces of code dispatched in many different files that sometimes are counterproductive, but cool concepts anyway. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how, um, yeah, how, how to keep it manageable. I mean, I, it probably in this little test language is not going to be, yeah, I, I don't know how far we'll get, to be honest. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, there's definite things of, like, you have code that won't compile, but then someone adds a trait, like, someone unrelated adds a trait, and now it's valid code because it now implements this thing, and it wasn't a type they owned. Um, so that's kind of interesting. We'll have to look into all of that kind of stuff. There's definite ways of doing it. You could say, like, like specifically requiring the, like, uh, importing the traits so it doesn't affect your code unless you said, hey, like, I'm dealing with these traits. Um, yeah, that'll be interesting. Okay, so I guess we start going through this stuff. And right at the top, I mean, we've already talked about the fine audio. There is some kind of resource there. Um... There's this is a is an ugly hack. So we have the the screen height in game units. Um, this should be part of some of the setup code. Um, so let's note that down. Actually, feels like it should be part of some setup code. That would be interesting because the other the only kind of top level resource we have right now is god other than the audio stuff which was hacked in later but in our original kind of experiment this was the only one and this was what would set things up um we even have this little setup state that we put in here to do these kind of things so but it, but it really doesn't feel right when yeah this, this needs to affect things early on um so yeah this is kind of strange it does feel like there should be some define game or something like this um yeah, so that was definitely the first thing. Next one is um, immediately, let's get a controller around here. Let's see, if, is this still hooked up? Whoop, whoop. Doesn't appear so. Oh, no, we're good. There we are. Um, so the, most things want to know if there's a collision between um, the orb and, or and like all the spaceship. Um, so all those walls and, and like uh, little missiles coming in want to know about the orb and the spaceship um they don't really have a way of doing that right now so we've got this kind of top level uh, variable here um so we can see orb and ship i uh, will leave directions for now we'll have to come back to that um and yes we've got this um set of orb here so the god spawns it during the setup code um but then but yes, and then it's shoving in this in this global variable, so it's available. Now it makes sense. We do have things like it would be it would, like conceptually at least it makes sense to be able to refer to these things. But it's odd that we have to make this extra variable and dump it in in some funky way. Whereas we do already have things that behave more like a resource, um, like the god is a, is this kind of top level singleton and stuff like this. So maybe there's a case for having some kind of like maybe a way to say on the actor that it actually has a specific name so if you just go it's like well the bell counter is a bad idea but if we went and find the orb um maybe we could say yeah name is orb and then you could refer to it just by that ver by that name everywhere else um i'm not too sure about that yet um because this like we're gonna look at bomber chap next, and that one you have like two, um, two playable characters, and so if you were to def, yeah, I'm, I'm just not entirely sure. Like, would you define several names like player one, player two, player three, player four, and then each of those um, are referable to them? Does that create all of them at once, or do they have to be like spawned specifically with that name? Um, and then we have to work out what would be the behavior if we spawned, tried to spawn one that already existed. Um, so yeah, it, again, there is a possibility for some kind of top level resource type thing here. So, um, top level bars like board and ship. Um, 
indicate some need for something of named resources. Yeah. Honda people saying <laughs> once this amazing game is finished and played by millions of people, would you make a series of episodes about implementing an AI that plays the game by itself uh, for all the Bomber Chap? That's a good question. Um, I hadn't thought of doing that, to be honest. Um, I mean, it's something we could do. Not a bad idea. I haven't really done any kind of um, game AI, so that, that would actually be quite fun. I mean, well, not... I. I oh, man. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Um, I mean, obviously, I've done. I, sorry, the, the, my brain's rambling around because every time you look at some like game, you uh, game AI stuff, you always get into like, oh, here's pathfinding and things like this, which I just don't consider to be part of that at all. Um, like pathfinding is important, but it seems like its own problem. And I've done some of that stuff before, just like kind of basic A star and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's fun, um, but not straight up AI. Um, but doing kind of like it'd be quite fun to um, implement, yeah, some logic based on, um, like we could do, we can do some simple um, like hierarchical state machine stuff or or things like that. There there are some AI systems like papers I've read that are kind of really interesting. I'd love to implement. Um, so that'd be cool. Yeah. No, thanks for that. That's a good idea. Um, now I'm going to distract myself. Um, just for POC, um, what's POC in this case? Sorry, my, my brain's just fuzzed out on me. I'm not sure if that's an acronym for some of the stuff we do or POC. Come on. What was that? I don't know. You tell me. Um, yeah, but it's definitely something we could look at. Yeah, it's silly. I hadn't even considered it, but we should do something like that. You know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to do some, um crowd dynamics stuff which would actually be perfect for this <laughs> this kind of thing because we get doing lots of parallel agents is is really cool um yeah we'll have to have a think about that Arasus is saying my master's thesis will be out real time IR nice that's really cool the system that I really like is the one from um uh fear was it fear where they have basically a, a goal space and then they do a kind of basically a pathfinding algorithm through the goals that they want to achieve and then like enact those. That's just really dope. Um, right, what am I doing? Okay, so I'm on the wrong machine. Now we've got this and colors and since, which is a time and best, which is another score thing, I guess. Um, so we've got just random data now that doesn't seem too bad to just leave around in variables I mean I don't think we need to go over the top with that I mean they are global resources again which again like because our little model was everything's separate everything's talking relatively to other things and stuff like that so it doesn't quite fit I don't really know what to do with that yet and it seems like kind of fairly low end problem we can come back to um, spawning walls that's the uh, this wall up here um, this is quite the fuck if I remember correctly um, let's see who actually calls this I'm guessing this is God yes okay so um, yeah there's some kind of wall timer function and it calls it and when it's true it it calls spawn wall and all this does is picks a distance suitably far away um, which is not very robust so it needs we need some more information you want us to be able to spawn something off screen um, not knowing about um, about the screen um, Even relative position would help. Um, so yeah, so sizes where you are and things like that. That seems like something you'd want, to, but you'd need to know to do this. Um, okay, so yeah, picks the center point relatively far away. Um, where are we? 
picks a random value and uses that to choose what um, thing we're going to be spawning, whether it's a wall red, wall green, wall blue. Um, picks a random angle there. Yeah, I guess that's just the starting point. So each of the curves don't look exactly the same. And yeah, it just spawns up a load of those points that make the wall. Um, but it's not done in any kind of sensible way. Like it doesn't take into account the size of the screen or anything like that. So it's, mm, yeah, not particularly great. Okay, and then we're spawning a whole bunch of stuff again. Fine. Then we get down to Define God. Um, we can see that it's setting up. It, see, this place is where we set up um, like locals to an actor. Um, so it feels like this one is meant to kind of represent the, the, the game. So wouldn't some of these resources actually belong here? The problem is obviously when they belong here, they would have to be handed down to other actors. And that just feels like extra faff. I mean, you could do it. I mean, it might require you to do that. But it's and this is one of the places where you start going well maybe the just like the model's cute it was a cute idea but maybe this is a place where you just go actually this is more faff than it's worth um and you just go ah screw it we'll, we'll do something else um oh psc proof of concept thanks man um and there is a link with no context i'm opening it on this machine first so i can see what um Machine learning for games. Ooh. So much of the machine learning now, like stuff that's been around recently, has just been such a soupy mess that I have not engaged with any of it yet. And like there are obviously techniques that are emerging and things like this and things getting a bit more nailed down, but I really should start looking eventually into that. But it hasn't grabbed my attention quite yet. kind of cool okay so then we have some playing of some music that's fine um, we have this thing as well we've got these um, hey there's something that already exists let's kill it and that's kind of interesting we don't have this game has started game has stopped kind of thing um, so it doesn't know when to kill things. In fact, there's no real way, I don't think, to say um, to kill everything. Okay, there is kill all of. Um, I bet that's a function that we added. Um, okay, yeah, look, hack only for dev. Yes, this was not meant to be something that was in the public API, but it just was required for this. So, that's an interesting thing. Um, and that's maybe it. Maybe, let's have a think about that, actually. The walls are made of tons of these entities, um, which is cool, but conceptually, like in, in terms of the game, they're one thing. Like, we, we've spawned a bunch of actors, and they all have simple behavior. But fundamentally, they're a wall. And when the wall hits something, it dies. So it's almost like you want to be able to say... To spawn some kind of collective and treat this as a single... As a single entity. Or at least be able to talk about it in some places as a single entity. Like maybe you want, you still want all of them to run their own update loops. You don't want them to just kind of do exactly the same thing as each other, but you want them to be some kind of, yeah, aggregation there that you can speak about them in some certain way. That's interesting. So there's a couple of things here. There's, um, system um, doesn't handle stopping and restarting. Um, Deleting old. Oh, sorry, yeah, have to um, delete old actors ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of interesting. And then we also have um, 
some things which in the games are um, like like one I don't know unit um, EG the wall in all um, can um, yeah are made of many actors um, um, yeah what's the always treated separately it would be cool um, yeah so we cool to have some kind of aggregation there um, that we could refer to each of those things hey you're spawning one of this, this is like to spawn it's almost like you there's a certain kind of actor called a wall and a wall is created by spawning a ton of these other actors but then they're all referable via this kind of one this one entity i'm not sure what i'm driving at yet but there's something there that kind of would be fun to explore because things like the explosions and stuff like this they're all one thing like what i want to be able to do is hey when any one of these hits like delete all of them and there's kind of oh there's something it makes me feel of um like when you're doing some compute shader stuff and you talk about things in the entire wave there's like a shared um like shared memory across the wave front um when you're doing the computation it kind of feels like yeah we've got this this aggregation of things and we want to be able to share some information between those but we also want to refer to that from outside so it's not really the same that's just where my head went on that interesting uh, RC says maybe a group ID could work and then you could treat those with the same ID as one unit. Totally, yeah, something like that. Um, we definitely want to be able to have each of these things be its own um, little actor. Because, like, where's the wall? Like, wall red, for example. Let's go and have a look at this. This is it's, it's getting ahead. But again, it's a really simple... Oh, maybe it's not a really simple thing. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this. But yeah, ostensibly, it should be a very simple actor. Um... But then, uh, yes. But yeah, then there's some complications due to the fact it has to work in synchrony with, with all these other things. Anyway. So that's the god thing. Let's have a look. Is there anything else? Um, changing state, I'm still fine with. Uh, yeah, there's that cleanup stuff that we wanted to have a look at. Um, in some cases, we are passing orb in. I'm not actually sure if that's used anymore. Let's go and have a look at ship. Um, orb, well, it is there. No. So at one point, we were passing this in, but it must have got too annoying or something while I was developing it. So all I did was just shove it in a global variable, which is kind of crap. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to do with that. It's interesting. Maybe it came down to starting and stopping the game and new things being spawned. Yeah, that feels like it could be that. So when if I'd stopped and restarted, then it would come back into this state, which would have spawned a new orb. But that should have spawned a new ship, wouldn't it? Yeah, and that would have passed that orb. Oh, I don't know. That's kind of weird. There's got to be something here then. What actually happens when you call stop? Um, no, it just it just actually stops it running, and then when it restarts, it'll carry from where it was rather than. Okay, so that's not particularly useful. Interesting. So I'm not really sure what this is, or maybe it was when we when I was testing, and. If you wanted to restart the game, you would want to, say, jump back to setup. But if you did that, yeah, then we're going to have these issues. Yeah, and most of the other stuff is pretty uh, temporary. Like, all of these would just, um, like, 
finish off their execution and die, just like normal, same with these. Um, so the only ones that actually would stick around are the ones that never get killed, which is the spaceship and the orb. So yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's it. Hmm. So it must have been from testing. Um, system uh, handle stopping and restarting. Have to delete old axes ourselves. Um, I think the uh, issue I was having. Testing, uh, restarting. Was, was restarting um, by switching God back to the setup state. Okie dokie. All right, and then we've got. Oh yeah, look. God damn it, it's right there. <laughs> We are the best detective. We could just look down. Check out Poirot over here. God damn. Okay. Um, so yeah, that was definitely it. Reset was a bugger because it would go back to this set, uh, this this setup thing, and we would have to kill these things. So really. Um, yeah, really, we just need a restart. Restart's tricky, though, because... Yeah, there are places you definitely want some kind of reset, and there are places you definitely don't. Um, like, one of the things that frustrated me when we making the game in the first Lisp Jam uh, was getting to that position where I had reinvented the recompile loop. It's like, like, oh, yeah, we're using Lisp, and it's all live and stuff like this, so when we make changes, we can see them immediately, unless the changes were to the st how to start the, like, the the state of the entities in the level that had already been spawned, like, what their health, what their starting health would be. So then you try to tweak their parameters, like, say you had, an, an, like, an aggressiveness. You can't just go back to the original definition and change the aggressiveness there. Um, because the entities have already been spawned. They, they're not connected to this pure data definition anymore. And so I was having to restart the level with every tweak, which was, again, it's very, very similar to just recompiling your game and starting again. You were losing state. So, yeah, that's... Um, restart is an interesting case. All right, so Val counters. This is just dumb. This is how I hacked together these little counters up here. Um... We need a text system. I think we've already written that down in here anyway. Um, yeah, we need a text system. There's no doubt. And then that can be an actor itself uh, of a certain kind. Okay, this is, it needs to know how long things have been running. It would just be good to have some um, uh, better time functions. Um, what kind of better time functions though? Because we have timers, don't we? Um, are they going off after a certain amount of time, or? Um, set. Yeah, I'm not sure quite where to go with that yet, but that's interesting. So you've got best score and things like this. Again, that was more part of that top-level data thing that I'm not too worried about. Um, spawn time. When is spawn time used? Okay. Oh, no, that's actually sp Yes, that's spawning the Val counters up here. So again, this would go away because all we'd have to do is spawn a couple of actors that actually represent the score. Um, we would need some interconnection there because it's again score is this top level thing. Um, so it's kind of uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, let's have a look. So then we've got the background, uh, which is just this, and that's just the background. And again, because it has no code, no update code underneath it, um, it's only you know rendered once and never has to be updated again. And we set up a default depth for it, which is fine. Then we get to orb. Um, let's have a look. What have we got here? Let's uh, give 
ourselves a bit more room. Let me make this a little smaller because we're not reading this too much right now. This is more important. Okay, so orb. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of variables here. We've got a default depth. We've got a tile count because obviously this is animated. We can go and look at the orb. Ah, so yes, that's interesting. We don't actually use um, the sprite for animation. We use it for the current state. Um, and I guess if we went and had a look, that the ship is the same. Um, yes, there we go. So we can see, oops, can I actually zoom in on these? No, okay, fine. Um, but yes, we have the three colored ships and we have the three colored orbs. Let's have a look at where we are now. And there's some loading of audio. So here we have a, we load something in and we're just storing it in a variable so we can call the um, audio system later and just say, hey, play this. That's kind of okay. So you just get this clip and you feed it to the play system and just say, hey, deal with this. So this switches to the second frame, which I guess, like, yeah, it's so that these two start out of sync, I guess, because every time you press a button, it's going to cycle to the next frame of animation. Um, so yeah, it goes to the next frame and then it changes the state main and the orb just sits there and what's spark. Um, okay, so there is a temporal function here, temporal lambda, um, that says each this number of seconds, uh, pick a random angle. Um, yeah, create a direction from that angle and spawn one of these little particles here and just send it on its way. Oh, and that's interesting as well. Its color is based on get frame. So again, are these sparkles... Yes, we have like the frames of animation um, going along the way. Oh, that's interesting. So yes, we can... I wonder if we actually use those different frames or we just use one of them. We only look at the vertical kind of axis there. Not sure. We'll see. And so we have color control swap up. What is swap up? It's just nil to begin with. What does that mean? Well, let's see. Something must have been passed in there. That's what I can imagine. So, I don't know. That's the first place it's mentioned. So, when swap up is true and pad, uh, pad button left, um, what's left in this case? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, these are the. Um, these are the button codes for the bumpers, which I've pressed to change, change color in each case. Okay, so when that is pressed and swap up, which I just don't know what swap up is yet, um, then we go to the previous frame, we set the swap up to be nil. Okay, so something is gonna set this to true and we uh, spawn stars. which is just a big sparkly ring that shoots out there, and that's fine. Um, okay, and then we've got keyboard controls. So th there are also keyboard controls for this game. So if I use left, right, up, down, and space to cycle between, there's no cycling forward and backwards. There's just cycle forwards. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, shift to, shift to fire. Let's have a look. Okay, so that's the same deal there. And then we go if... Oh, okay, this is um swap button up. Um, so this stops us from holding down the button and just getting it to cycle constantly. I guess if we um, press this and... Oh no. interesting it's interesting because it defaults to nil to start with um, oh well. oh yeah there are spawn stars there as well just 
loop 360 degrees and spawn a bunch of stuff. That's also another thing. I've seen both 2pi being mentioned here and like because the default is things are done in degrees in this little engine but here I'm having to reach out to um, RTG math and then it's back and I'm doing things in radians again which is uh, okay so that's interesting um, not that like uh, from radians it's just like in our silly little system we were we were just uh, doing it that way anyway color controls failed what's this okay so Um, yes, yeah, so it calls, orb calls failed with reset, and all it is doing is saying, hey, if I've collided with this kind, any of this type, or this type, or this type, um, yeah, then kill all of the, of this specific type. Yeah, that's fair enough. So again, this code could be tidied up, but that's not a particularly big deal. It is interesting that we, we've got in this case, we've got the red and green and blue things are separate types, like separate actor kinds. I mean, look at this. All red, all green, all blue. Why? Why were they separate? That's and It's obviously really dumb, but it might have been just... Like, I'm not sure if I was doing it because I was being lazy. It's just copy paste, let's go. Or if it was actually that um, there was some differentiation we needed to make. And there is. There is, and this comes to one of the crux kind of problems with our system as it stands at the moment. And that is um, that the way we were doing collision is each kind of actor... Like, so all of the wall reds are um, written into one collision mask. And then we're able to compare anything with that collision mask. So for us to be able to tell the difference between, hey, did I collide with... Um, yeah, basically, did, did I collide with a wall of a certain color? Because color matters in this case. Because, again, if this is green and this is green, it's got to pass straight through. <laughs> Yes, we need to be able to know exactly what um, state the thing was that hits us. And all we get information is, did something hit us or not? So we have to separate these things out into these separate actors just to be able to tell them apart in collision, which is obviously rubbish. Um, so we'll need to do something about that. Um, there's also the case of... Let's have a think. Um... What was I gonna? What was I gonna say? Hmm. Red, wall, green. Oh yes. Okay. The other thing is because we have our little state machines built into the actors, so you just say, "Hey, here's the name of a state," and then this is the stuff that happens in our, uh, every frame whilst we're in that state, and then we change state. Um, yeah. It's um. It means we have to repeat this code. We can't just make a common function um, for wall behavior and then define wall red, wall green, wall blue. Like, say if I could do this. Um, do wall or whatever. Blah, 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 and then just do this here. I mean, it would still be ugly, but it would be less heinous because, again, there wouldn't be that code duplication. But now we've got to change it in three places every time we tweak something, which is obviously very sucky. Um, so yes, there's something we need to be able to do there. And it really comes down to, again, the, the fundamental, hey, we're trying to do really big batches of things and we aren't able to tell the difference between stuff. So we need to look at that. So not being able to tell... Um, Collision by kind sucks. Cool. Um, sorry, I missed a few things here. 
One of them saying, question about the game design. Why, if there are two walls crawling to the orbit of the ship, is none of, like, wait a second. If there are two walls crawling to the orb or ship, if one of them hits the players with the wrong color, both walls disappear. Shouldn't the player lose health and then the, um, the first wall disappear? Oh, in, in this case, again, it was a really simple, it's almost like arcade kind of fuck you, where it just, it, it's game over immediately. Um, so the only thing that really matters is this timer up here. And, and that's kind of what's of interest. So it's more just how long can you go without fucking up? And as soon as the, the fuck ups happened, then it's just, you've essentially reset and you're starting again. So if we just let this collide here, bang, we go back to zero. Um, yeah. It's not, fair. like, it's not, these aren't good games, but they were kind of, it was that little challenge of, hey, can we make a, a, a number of entries in the time allotted? Um, which answer was no, because we spent most of the time dicking around with the engine, as per usual. Okay, so, so yes, this um, not being out, like having to separate things out just to get uh, kind of different communication or interaction behaviors sucks. And we're going to see this a big way when we get to Bomber Chap. So let's see if we can speed through some of this stuff. Oh, don't think we can actually. Let's have a look. So we looked at failed. We got to hit wall. Um... Oh yeah, this is just what happens once you hit a wall. It's um... yes. Look, here we go. Ah, oh, you can just search for double colon and you can see problems. Um... Wow. Okay, so it's having to like it. Yeah, it's getting all the actors by a certain name, and then it's having to get all of this frames actors because those are the ones you have to um, fuck with, and then it's changing the state on all of those. Oh dear, that's really bad. That's really bad. So yes, there needs to be some way of... Um... So I was saying, like, I was kind of thinking originally, you could have some kind of messaging system um, where you pass some information to another actor. So that's kind of like, again, fits in with... It makes me think of Erlang, to be honest, where each, um, each entity has an inbox and you can check, you can... Um... Yeah, you can pull from that inbox and you can receive messages. And that is something we could do. Um, so everyone, you just have a linked list, which is the inbound messages. Everyone just pushes onto the end of it. You don't worry about order. Um, you just say that that's, um, yeah, an unordered resource. And then at the beginning, um, yeah, the beginning of the frame, you could then, um, pull that in. I wonder if the thing with Erlang is they actually say, if you don't, you can you can pull specific messages out of the queue in Erlang, which means you can leave ones behind, which means you can get like inbox overflow. So I don't think we want to do that in this. It might al almost be worth doing. Hey, if you don't pick up the inbox, like, then it gets cleared, or it has a max length. Uh, yeah, or like yeah, it might be that just clear it. You clear it each frame, so you either deal with the messages you're given or not. Um, so let's start, say you need to be able to send messages to other entities. Um, inbox question mark. Um, but the other thing is, it wouldn't be as necessary. It wouldn't be dramatic like this if we had the ability to group those things together, like we were talking about earlier, because then we could say, "Hey, this is wall. This is you know, we spawned a wall, and then when one of them dies, they can share that one of them hits." Uh, you can share that information among all of the members of the um, of the collective, and then they could all respond to that and and kill themselves, which is probably fine. And so yes, this goes through. <laughs> oh my god, look at this! So yeah, then it just goes and kills all of the walls that are currently there and plays a sound and yeah respawns shit. Okay, dear me. This is strange as well. Ugh, I don't even want to know. Um, ship is very FPS dependent. Hooray! That's a good point. We never actually put... Um, yeah. Do we, um, do we know that down? Fix time step. Move some code around. Except not... Yeah, okay. So we need to... Um, 
Adifex time step expose something so we can talk about. Yeah, we need to we need better ways of talking about frequency and time and things in this in this system. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have a think about that. Um, blah 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 blah. Let's have a look. Bunch of stuff. Um, So again, here we get to the point where we're having to, we're, we're reaching out into RTG math rather than just using the little library we've got. We're incrementing like a velocity so we can get that nice kind of uh, drifty slowdown behavior, which is slightly like, like, is that direction? See, that direction to me seems like, um, like a screen space or world space direction in this case. So let's have a look. Dear is yes. Yeah, we've got compass direction move. So again, we're, we're talking about um, things in screen space. So we really just need to be able to make the screen something we can refer to um, and to use it as some kind of orientation, like way to orientate ourselves. So yeah, it was all very cute saying, oh, we'll only be able to talk about other things we can refer to and stuff like everything will be relative. But I think we need to know about the screen so we can do things relative to the screen. Just say that's a thing and... Yeah, then try and clean up the API so it feels nice with that. Then everything can be like rotate can be, it's always relative to yourself unless you specify something else and then rotate is relative to that. Um, that could work. Um, da, 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 da. Angle to degrees, oh, this just gets so ugly. Um, You've got some per second stuff here. So in an effort to make it less sucky with different frame rates, but it's... Face move P, one second, let's see what that gets set by. Okay, I'm not sure what that's all about yet. Set angle from analog stick. We've got some things there. Um, and then the swap up thing, this color control thing was the same kind of collision stuff we were using before, I think, for the orb. It definitely was something we were calling an orb. Um, and there's some more shit here for shooting. And yes, yeah, spawning bullets and stuff like this. And it's spawning two because it's firing one from each side whenever we press the button down. Um, yeah, and then we define bullets. Look at that. Move forward. Um, and if we're not in the world, die. Um, so this in-world thing, yeah, we'll, we'll need to kind of come back to that as well. Um, Solidify what being in the world means. Um, yeah. Also, when we can talk about the screen properly, we can just say off screen because we don't. In this game specifically, we don't care once it's off screen. Just destroy it. Um, so dead white. I think that's this little uh, sparkle there. Because those are. Yeah. Not sure. Let's have a look. Dead white is you turn by a certain angle and then you change your state to main and this just goes you're advancing a frame at a certain rate, you're moving forward, you're scaling. Okay, yeah, that's this. So it's cycling the frames, it's um and it's just scaling itself down. And then yeah. And then, and then, then it, like, oh yeah, if it's all it's outside the world or whatever, it dies as well. Cool, that's it. This is the do scale thing, which is it's another temporal function, which says, before three seconds have passed, just keep doing this, um, and then once those three seconds have passed, it's going to come down here, and once it will die. It, like obviously, once it's dead, it's not going to do it again. But that's all that function does. So it calls this um, until three seconds have passed, and then it calls this once nice and then is how these things are composed 
these are kind of crazy. These uh, get expanded into um, big old state machines. <laughs> uh, but in this case, they're just little temporal lambdas. It's an old side project. Um, so Arsu is saying maybe time as itself could be actors. Yeah, there's not. Um, we could. How do you think that would work? So things would would something spawn if if one thing needed a timer, would it spawn this actor? Because so far actors have all been visible things, pretty much. Yeah. So I'm not really sure. But do like yeah, run with that. Let's let's um, throw your thoughts down in the chat and same to everyone else as well. Um, I'd love to hear. What you think we could do with this, or if you just think enough, enough, make it go away, we're done, and uh, we'll go. We can do something else. So sparkles, I'm not sure what those are from. I'm. Oh, I, I know what they are. They're um, when the when the walls are moving across, um, they occasionally drop little sparkles. Um, so again, this is. Um, Setting up. Let's have a look. <sighs> oh yeah. So this is interesting. I was wondering why this temporal lambda here is being set up in the setup code rather than um, how we saw before, which was just in the in the um, kind of what do we call this? I don't the local data section. Um, and the reason is it wants to use one of the values that's passed in. It's kind of unfortunate that this can't refer to something else. It can, ooh, that's kind of, yeah, because if we do allow it to refer to other things in here, then there's an ordering issue with what's passed in. Mm. Yeah, I don't really know. Not sure what to do with that yet. Um, but this does feel a little ugly. Um, data in the local data section of an actor um, can't computed from values in um, pass from spawn. I don't know what we can actually do about that, but that's fine. Let's get some more coffee. All right. So it sets its frame, it goes here, and it moves forward at a certain speed, and it's scaling, and then it dies. And that's fine. That's just these little sparkles that just kind of sit there or travel backwards very slowly um, yeah and then perish so perish then missile missile is very simple it um, freaks out if there isn't oh yeah okay so this is one of the problems as well when we were doing that reset um, that deletes the orb and the ship then it freaks out if the orb isn't there um, oh, that's interesting actually because yeah, yeah, like, so when we would do a reset, it would, yeah, that's kind of strange. Because I thought we killed it and then spawned it, like, pretty much in the same frame, so I'm not sure what the deal is, but obviously there was some problem there at some point. So, yeah, we need some kind of reset mechanism that handles this kind of stuff more gracefully, because we've got this shitty code leakling. Leak, leakling, there you go, word of the day, leakling. Um... Move towards the orb, turn towards the orb. Again, we're talking about a, some top-level reference to a thing. Um, when you collide with a bullet, you change state into dying. Um, when you collide with an orb, print game over, man, and change state to dying. Um, and the dying state is just... Um, it just spins around and spawns um, a shit ton of the sparkles. So that, actually, this guy's going to do it in a second. Um, so it hits it, bam, and it just spins around and spawns all those different colors. Um, and that is it. So 
So do wall x this. I guess it's this. When less than random 500 spawn dead white speed zero. Oh no, that's the thing that leaves those trails. I wonder what the sparkles were then. I guess, ugh, I don't know. Never mind. And then we get down to our walls and we've got the three different walls defined because we need to be able to collide with them separately and that sucks. And then we've got kill all of and names of... Oh wow, they're actually defined in here. Wow, that sucks. Okay. So yes, that was all a bunch of hacks. Um, so that's not ideal and we would want to clean this up if we were going to continue forward with this little 2D engine. Right, let's stop. Let's see if we can bring up um, bombing... Was it Bomber Chap? I can't even remember the name of the game. There we go. <laughs> it doesn't delete the other actors. Let's just restart. Hey, kid. And now, an awkward silence. Broken only by the person who brings up the awkward silence. Okay, let's get rid of that. This. Just got our notes. Alright, now we should be back in business. Bombing champ, let's say run. <laughs> I didn't realize that was on screen. That's amazing. Okay. Ooh. So, yep, there's the, the game running as it was before. A really painfully small resolution. That is really making the sprites look super ugly. But yeah, that's fine. That can be left there. Um, yeah, now we're going to look at how bad this code is. And this one got nasty. So, again, we got a bunch of um, top-level data that's just dropped up here. Um, like the number of wins and things like this, which... Um, thing that resets those values. We got the audio defined at the top, which is completely fine. Um, we've got a the god that goes and loads all the levels and adds a timer and play track. I mean, this is one of the thing you can't just build these systems. They all look very cute, um, and you can make the kind of core API um, kind of fun. But then at some point, you need to go out and just do general data processing. Like this thing needs to go and load in a file and and do some shit with it, which is just back to normal code. And there's nothing super friendly about that. So there is a kind of limited reach of the things you can do with just a cute execution model for the um, for the uh, actors in general. Um, Kit saying, it's Minesweeper. Yes, that is what it is. Except you have to walk around and place the bombs. and It's, uh, yeah, it's what happens before the Minesweeper starts. It's just a little dude walking around placing bombs. Um... Load the track, load some music, change state to load menu. That gets to us to the menu. Uh, we got change level. Ah, yeah, this is some of the stuff straight away. Um, having to do things as God. Um, this was a hack to deal with the fact that we don't, again, because we don't have the concept of where the camera is in the world, where we are in the world. Um, spawning things at certain positions and making it sure it's being looked at is annoying. Um, so all we do here is we we um, like get to the position of God, which is zero, 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 and spawn things from there. <sighs> it's sucky. I don't like it. Um, yeah, so it's not great. So we really need to know where we are in the world and um, slip up. Um, where are we? Um, how do we focus the camera? In places, etc., etc. Some of that I think we've already answered, but I can't remember the camera controls right now. All right, so 
Um, yes, when we're in the menu, you can just uh, hit escape to quit the game. Um, you can use either return or pad button zero to go to the first uh, level. So we just kill the logo. Um, again, set logo to nil. Do you need to do that? Um, I guess yes, because it's keeping a reference to it up here. And then, um, yeah, you go to the next level and change the state of the game. And all this is doing is every so often it's doing the shake. Um, so in this case, we're using the timers rather than temporal functions. Maybe that's good. Um, when the key de when key down key escape, yes, that's just to quit the game. Um, when level button down, oh yes, yeah, so we have we have a button for just changing the level. I think that's J. So if we go in here and do J, yes, there we go. We can swap around between the few levels that we had. Um, then what? So that's not so interesting. The shake stuff isn't very interesting. Actually, yeah, that's using a little temporal function again. Um, the logo is very simple. It's just, again, it, it bounces in. But once again, we've got these, like, um, again, we're using some easing functions from vids library, which is fantastic. Um, but we're also having to do a lerp between two positions, um, which have to be absolute, because uh, if you're shifting over time, then that is going to look weird. Um, kids saying, uh, did you make this game for Game Jam? This was, yeah, last year's... Um, this was uh, I made two entries for last year's Game Jam, and they were made using um, a little a kind of toy 2D engine that we made on the streams. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, we're kind of looking at it now because um, when I was doing that, there was a whole bunch of hacks that I had to do um, to just to get it to ship on time um, because there's loads of stuff that our little engine couldn't do. And dude, that went through all the blocks. Is that legal? Yeah, it's probably legal. Um, and so, yeah, we're kind of looking at it now and seeing what we would have to do to fix it up to kind of make the model consistent again and um, what we would need to do. Yeah, and, and yeah, what we would need to do and if it's worth it. That's kind of where we're at. So this list over here is uh, we went through the, the things that were hacked into the engine last week and now we're looking through the two game entries that were that I made during that week um, to, yeah, just to see what kind of mess that like all the kind of workarounds I had to do to get this thing to ship, um, and then yeah, just to find out what we could do. How do on earth do you make a game engine? Um, well, we don't do anything very advanced in this one. Like we we kind of come up with a we've decided on how. It's basically a game engine is a set of decisions. That, that's really all it is. Um, you are you're just kind of deciding how the rendering is going to be done, what kind of techniques you're going to use. You decide on um, like what um, systems there will be in the engine and how they'll communicate to each other and things like this. Like the the flow of what makes up a frame and it's yeah, it's kind of this is again is very much a toy engine all we decided was there was going to be a thing called an actor in fact let's just bring up a really simple example again um when we have the one from daft tests um test alien this was the little um this was our little example we made way back when so what we wanted was we wanted to be able to define little actors um and it's the the mental model is Every single thing is running in parallel, and they all have their own little main loops. So the main, the kind of main loop here is every frame. All it's going to do, a bullet is just going to move forward. And if it's collided with anything of the kind alien, or if it's no longer in the world, then die. Um, actually, that's a good point. The thing should die automatically if you're not in the world. Um, Actor should be either um, constrained to the world or automatically 
die if they leave it. Because we've got a bunch of places which is going, hey, I, if I'm outside the world, then kill me. But if it's outside the world, it shouldn't be running anymore anyway. So we can do that automatically. So yes, so this would be all the code that is needed um, for a bullet, for example. And everything is done when you when you write the code for an actor. It's all in terms of itself. So when you say move forward, it doesn't matter what angle it's at. It's moving forward in its kind of local rotation. Um, so then you'll see um, this is a little um, a spinner that shoots bullets that goes travels down the screen and spins around shooting bullets everywhere. Um, and all this is doing is rotating. Um, by four degrees like it so it's moving down the screen it's rotating by four degrees and then it um when it's time for it to fire a bullet it spawns a bullet and then it turns 90 degrees and spawns another bullet turns 90 degrees spawns another bullet so it shoots four bullets out at 90 degrees from each other and that's it that's all it does until it leaves the world and then it dies um so yeah like you write these tiny little programs and they go together to make a little game um so in this one, uh, you have a ship, and there are some aliens, and you just have to shoot them. That's simple enough. Um, and then there's this kind of god actor that's always there, and it's the one that gets spawned automatically at the start of the game, and it spawns other things. Um, so yeah, that was the that was the general model. Um, but obviously it's a very simplistic model, and it sucks in a lot of places. We were also trying to do, like, we wanted to be able to have tens of thousands of actors on the screen and so the ways to handle collision and stuff were kind of like we picked some we picked we picked some interesting design decisions there um which made some of the stuff very hard to do later on so yeah seal isn't fast enough really for 3d games is it there's only one 3d engine i'm aware of it's not like <sighs> it, it's tricky it depends what kind of 3d game you would want to do if we're talking about doing like assassin's creed and something you're going to struggle. Like, yeah, the, the language does have limitations that would make that very difficult. It, do, it makes it very, like, it's tricky to be able to talk about the layout and memory explicitly enough, which makes it harder to do some of the optimizations you need to do. I mean, like, again, I can't see the games being written in Common Lisp on consoles, for example, um, because there are a lot of memory overheads and things like this where that would become quite painful i mean like you you hear people that actually ship in this talk about f like getting down to the last few kilobytes of ram on a ps4 or whatever and just like that might have been ps3 that specific example i'm thinking of but yeah like really they use everything that the machine's got every possible resource they're trying to squeeze something out of and so if you have any overheads introduced by your tools that causes problems and we have like a garbage collector and you don't get to say when garbage collection happens. And if that happens in the middle of a frame, that sucks. Um, and yeah, you just don't have enough control to do some of those things. You can totally do a 3D game in CL. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of techniques you could do. If you went outside the spec, there's a lot you could do to make it fast enough. And we definitely will be doing that. Like that's some of the SIMD stuff and things like that we want to look at. Um, it's, yeah, super interesting. But the same problems will be true for Python for, yeah, every language where you have stuff that's very much out of your control. But there's a long way you can go. And it's kind of my, very much my belief that there is a, you can have high level languages that get closer to that place. Um, and yeah, without compromising while still keeping stuff like the live coding and things like that, which I love. So yeah, um, I need some rainbow paren. Nah, I'm fine. I had that on for a while, but it uh, yeah annoyed me after a bit. Yeah, if you can make a 3D game in Java, you can make it in CL. And in like Unity as well as using C Sharp. C Sharp has a garbage collector. Um, I'm not sure Unity have probably done work to actually take control of the garbage collector a bit. Um, but there's still lots of places in, in Unity where you end up doing things that are just... Uh, yeah, more costly than they need to be. But that's true of anything higher level, so it's... Yeah, I'm, I'm not specifically ripping on them. It's just, yeah. And Kid was saying, CL is hella fast for, um, for yeah, how amazingly expressive it is. Super true. Like, and there's, there's all kinds of things you can do with like the fact that you have macros. The fact that you're allowed to do things at compile time makes a huge difference to the kind of code that you can write. Right? You don't have to 
like try and formulate this thing necessarily as oh this this needs to be formulated through this particular abstraction that our language uses everything has to be immutable and things like this and then you're really hoping the compiler can work out how to unpick your code into something fast which surprise surprise it can't do in the general case like even even like c plus plus kind of compiler stuff you get into cases where oh we added a fix to this function like it's two two days before release and you make a tweak to a function because there was a bug and now it it blows the uh, compiler's kind of um, optimization budget. So this function doesn't get inlined, which means this kind of hot loop that is being used is now 10 times, well, not 10 times slower, slow enough that it suddenly becomes a massive problem for your game shipping. Like these things aren't, yes. Zero cost abstractions is eh, questionable in the general case. Um, but yeah, CL is amazing. And you can, again, it's all about what, what shape things are in memory and the shape of your instructions and like if you're doing things that lend well to the, what the machine has been made to be able to do well um so again like when you have um like when you have complex numbers and you're doing a load of math on those at least in sbcl sbcl often compiles um math done on these into simd expressions um which is cool like we're, we're using the resources of the machines so that certain things are going to go pretty fast if you're using structs um you can um like yeah it, it's it's packed so there's certain things that can be left unboxed in memory like if you have a a struct foo and we've got an x and we put a um cfi null pointer in here and we actually tell it that it's of site CFI, um, what's it called? Is it just pointer? Or a system pointer? Like, I know, uh, because SVCL calls them system area pointers, I think. Pointer, what's the pointer type in, is it foreign pointer? Maybe it's foreign pointer. Yeah, there's a type, foreign pointer. Um, yeah, in this case, it's gonna be able to store this pointer unboxed. Whereas if you start passing this around functions, it's gonna to have to box it. Um, and there's all kinds of cases like that. And again, like if you have, um, if you have y is one, two, three. I'm not sure if we actually got that there. Um, and the type is a simple array of, um, single float um, three like this is an array of three single floats and it can store these unboxed inside structs so again you kind of you're packing things together and you do stuff like this there's a paper that's comes up every now and again in common lisp which is like how to make lisp faster than c or something like that like let's go find it because lisp faster than c because it comes up and it's like yes but Ah, like there are limitations like and of course one of the big sacrifices as soon as you go with structs um oh yeah of course that chat is fucked one second i have to rejoin the irc from this machine join baggers Did that come through yeah there we go um Yeah, so there's the paper. Um, yeah, you can get very efficient code out of um, specific Lisp implementations, and that's really cool. Um, but again, it's just about like, did it generate good code? And and as soon as you go structs, um, Jace is saying, wait, uh, can SBL, SBCL store an array inside a struct unboxed? I do believe so, yes. For certain, like for certain thing, I think that's correct. Now I'm getting, I feel like I'm about to call out. I know that like, hmm, like values in, oh shit, no, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe I've got that wrong. The floats inside the array are unboxed. Right, that is, that is the case. But the array itself can't be. 
Thank you. Then that was my bad. Sorry about that. Um, don't trust my descriptions. It was what we're learning here. So yes. Um, yeah, some things can be unboxed. That's really cool. And then stuff is actually tighter together in memory, which is going to help you not chasing pointers all the time. Um, you're able to do this kind of stuff like declaiming that you want things to go fast and um, or in this case, not. Um, and yeah, like if you write things in the way the machine wants, then yes, you can get fast code and that's really cool. But one of the things that like I believe in here was doing things with structs. Um, and as soon as you start using structs, you can't recompile them on the fly. Or actually, maybe this one wasn't. Wow, it's been a long time since I read this. But yeah, writing writing Lisp to be faster than C um, isn't going to be the kind of Lisp you've been writing all the time. Like it's not the style that's very like that's comes naturally out of using Common Lisp, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I don't know how we got onto this. Um, not being able to change structs is annoying. Yeah, but it's like that. That's the reason that you're able to get like like the accessors and set the setters and getters get inlined into other functions, which is awesome. The types then become known. So it like, yeah, the more information you can have at compile time, the better code you can generate, but you can only do that by setting limitations. And then if you were to recompile your struct with like different members or different types on the members, then suddenly all of the other code that you've optimized, assuming certain things is now wrong. So it's like, uh, we can clearly do some stuff. We're able to we're able to throw a lot of things on the screen using Common Lisp, and we've been doing all our all of our three D shit in Common Lisp without any problems. And we're we're not like we're we're not even vaguely touching the performance of the machine. Um, Tom was saying a while ago, oh, sorry, I kind of skipped over your comment there, but amazing to think that Lisp was embedded in RAM big programs, missile calculations on machines with like zero fucking megabytes of RAM. Totally, man. It's, uh, yeah. It is useful stuff. On the topic of compilers not being able to figure out everything, there's a series of blog posts from a guy who wrote the ISPC compiler. It's so good. I love that blog series. And he also talks about how the auto vectorize uh, is especially tricky beast. And you just, yeah, and it just can't do it. I mean, like, there's all kinds of cases where you just can't generate good vectorized code. And, um, yeah. Totally, totally agree, man. Totally agree. Um, into what expressions uh, Kid was saying earlier? Uh, SIMD expressions. This is where you have a single instruction which works on multiple data at the same time. So normally you have, say, plus x and y, right? Um, so we can add two values together in a single instruction. This will do four pluses at once, for example, if it was floats. So you would take a vector of four floats and another vector of four floats, and it will return a vector of the four results. Um, so if you can lay your code out right and get everything into the right shape, then you can get significant speed ups by doing multiple things at the same time. But it requires your memory to be, your data to be packed together into memory because you've got to load those four things packed into a register. So yeah, it gets um, it's interesting. And again, like our language doesn't allow us to specify that. Commonless doesn't, in the standard, say this is how this thing has to be laid out in memory because that wasn't its design goal. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, just saying the trouble is like I can take a reference to that array and then assign a new array to that slot in the struct. It, it, yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's why we can't do it. Kid saying, but class lets you tell the compiler the type of the property. No. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they like with all the class stuff, you're not really able to rely on that not changing. I mean, there are there are functions in like this might be getting this wrong because class isn't my strong point, but you can change the type of an instance once it's already been instantiated, which changes loads of things about its behavior and what's on it and all kinds of things. And like we can recompile things on the fly. So then, so basically, none of the code that uses that stuff can like inline and optimize assuming types because those types could change. 
which is why like when you're using methods and classes and things like that it's necessarily going to end up slightly slower than if it's done in a way that you know the types um simd yes s-i-m-d um we did a little episode on it a while ago actually which was a lot of fun that was when we started doing some assembly stuff from uh from sbcl jace has ex explained everything i was just saying better and in less words which is great um pond of him saying game dev have always been at the uh, uh, i can't read game dev have always been really at the max level of exploit um yeah, explo explo exploit the very uh, last resource on the machine console. Uh, see what some games like Mario Kart made in the stairs, Prince of Persia. Yeah, totally. Like, every time you get everything out of the machine, and then the next machine comes along, you can't just like, oh, we've got headroom now, so we can do the same techniques again, because now your thing doesn't look good, so you have to get everything out of that machine. It's like, it's super, it's super fun. I, I think those design decisions and stuff are where all the interesting shit is, because you can't, because it's limited. Right? You can't just be lazy. Like, so if you're going to have something that's high level um, and you can express in, then you've really got to be really smart about it. And that's just so that's so cool to me. Um, change class is crazy. Like, yeah, that's really cool. Hold on, no man, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Man. Um, Yeah, I highly recommend a lot of the... There's, there's a there's just a bunch of GDC talks I can... I think I've brought up in various episodes. Um, but yeah, there's the the Naughty Dog one on fibers and things like that. Just seeing what people do there. I also highly recommend, like, go to... Like, watch the videos from CppCon that are about performance. Because that's C++, which is meant to be, oh, super fast and everything like this. And then people saying, hey, we had performance problems, and here's why. And it comes down to how your data lit, how do your data laid out, and and all kinds of other things as well. Um, kids saying game dev is your day job, right? Yes, um, but I'm total noob. This is my first project, and I'm not very good at it yet. But I'm learning. I'll get there. But I'm very excited about all this stuff. I find it just a fun design space because it's real time. There's limitations. Yeah, it's it's cool. You like here's your thing. You have to do sixty frames a second. That's thing. And again, like in my day job, I'm using Unity, so I don't think about most of this stuff in that way all the time. Um, oh yes, who just linked um, large scale systems architecture? That is not the talk I was thinking of, but that's fucking awesome. Um, how how can I how can it be my day job? But you're a noob. Uh, I team up with my mate, and we're gonna make a game, or we're, we're making a game. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Like I, I, uh, I saved up a bunch of money, and I've basically been working full time off off my own money for a while now. And then, um, yeah, we're gonna release the game, and hopefully it goes well. I mean, the alpha's out already. People are playing it. Not very many because we haven't let many people in yet. Um, we're gonna let another thousand in soon. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, Pomodoro was saying large-scale architecture was recommended by yourself last time. That was, yes, I was watching that last time. That was really cool. Yeah, it's a great talk. Um, but the one I was thinking of was one on threads. No, fibers, fibers, that was it, sorry. But yeah, brilliant. There's, there's so many good talks. You're going forever. Anyway, what are we doing? Oh, yeah, this crappy game. We talk about all the highfalutin and all these possibilities, and then we go back to this thing, which is just like super dynamic language mess like <laughs> silly model that had all these problems with still fun though all right so um da -da -da. so moving the chap this is this is where we got into a bunch of things like um all of our um stuff when we were doing okay let's get this up where Um, all of our little tests that we were doing... Oh, look at that horrible collision. Um, all of the tests we were doing... What was I trying to say? Um, when we were messing around with this little thing, um, were with, like, spaceships and things like this, which were rotating. Uh, it was top-down games. Um, whereas this one's kind of ostensibly from the side. And so when you're moving left and right, you're not rotating 
at um, any point. So it's picking different frames at uh, different points. And yeah, so this, this ends up meaning just, yeah, we just end up having to handle that. It might be nice to be able to have something to, I don't know. I don't know if we, you build that into the kind of engine, like, oh, this is going to be a thing where it, like, nah, I, I don't really know. Like, how I want that to be represented, like whether it's ro rotation, because you do want to move in that direction, but rather than rotating the image, you want to do something else with it. Um, some kind of relationship between rotation and visual. Bomber chap side view. And yes, there's all these kind of hacks for that. And then this was the worst bit. Okay, this this is where things get really nasty. Um, so remember that whole thing where we couldn't um, to be able to have things to be able to talk about whether things collide or not uh, with each other. They have to be separate types. Well, that means that um, the two bomber men need to be different actors which means all the code has to be the same but then we need two define actors with all the same code so i ended up wrapping it in this macro let so we could do that and it was just fucking awful um yeah there's all of this problem falls out of the fact that if you're going to compare for collisions in the way we've done it so far they have to be different um actors they have to be different kinds um and that sucks so yeah, that was that was a real problem, and that needed to be done so that like, actually no, every all bombs kill you regardless. Oh yeah, but you need to be able to know whose bomb killed you to know what the score is. Um, that's a big ugly piece of ugly. Yes, that is what that is. It was fucking awful. I hated it, um, and it was like, so it was like we made this toy little engine and like oh it's really fun, and then we start trying well trying to do things in the week. It was like. This sucks. All of this sucks. Everything's broken. Why do I do this? Yeah. So it was. Uh, that was funny. Um, I have a separate actor for the dying chaps, which is great. That just is like because it's completely different behavior. So it was just simple enough to kill the original actor and spawn the dying version, and that's it. Um, and then yes, these are the actors that are used for displaying who wins. Again, this should be able to be merged, but it's not. I think, that, yeah, I could have just made these as two frames of the same animation and then just picked it based on which one won. That would be really simple to do, so I won't worry about that. Um, the ghosts. Again, this was a thing where we need to lerp between two positions. So we're talking about absolute positions on, in the world again, uh, which we don't cover properly yet. Uh, we've got flames. Um... <laughs> if uh yeah so um what the fuck was that about okay so the way the flames work as you can see here is that I'll do it with the other one because he's got longer flames um, when we place the bomb it's going to blow up and then it's going to spawn five flames and each of those five flames is going to spawn the next flame in the direction that it's traveling let me show you what's this which is why it kind of goes out because it's like one per frame is being spawned um, so yeah that's how that's working and that's why it's that's why that code looks like that in that place um but yeah, not great. As our collision mask gives us so little info, this is, and this is only two player, we're bodging how we handle who owns what. Oh, what are we doing here? Um,
Yeah, here we go. Two different kinds of bombs. Yeah, so we have the common behavior factored out into a function, and then we have the two bombs just call it, which sucks. Um, and it really is just so, it's probably not necessary. You just need to pass the information of who created the bomb down to the flames. So then the flames can, like if they hit something, they can increment the right score. So this probably isn't necessary, uh, but the two, um, the copies of the bomb men definitely were necessary and that sucked. And we have this, look, we have different power-ups, um, have different actors, which kind of makes sense, like, uh, it's kind of annoying. It's all right. I mean, part of this is it was going to be, you're going to have slightly less abstraction because of the model, the way we designed it. So that's kind of fine. Um, but yeah, some of it is just downright broken. And that is that. Okay, so that's basically us gone through those games and identified the worst stuff. Um, what was it? That, so screen height and units is where we started today. Whoa. So yeah, this is the stuff we kind of got from the last two games. Let's just see what's going on in chat again, because I went in a bit of a ramble. Um, Elevate Simulator says, to be fair, if code isn't well documented, um, it can be easy to write your own thing from scratch rather than trying to figure out someone else's code. Yeah, that happens. Unfortunately, like, and even, yeah, um, even when it's fairly well documented, it can be documented to the point which makes sense for the uh, the person doing the project, right? Like, how do you get an understanding of how something behaves memory-wise without going and reading it? Like, unless the person who wrote the library was actively concerned about this stuff, then like then like and then they've documented it. Like, this has this kind of performance characteristics and these behaviors and stuff like that depend it really depends on what questions you want to ask to whether that information is going to be available um yeah kid saying reminds me of converting an algorithm written in c to common lisp yeah yeah i remember doing that with all the um like learning open gl i did which i did just by like i'd have an open gl tutorial and then common lisp and i was doing the stuff um, with CL Open GL in Common Lisp. Um, Jason's saying, I don't write engines or configure editors. I screw around with random nonsense, help other people to do those things. Yeah, man. I like making tools, though. I just love it. Um, Pom to Pimp linked something. Reading the Zero MQ manual. It's a masterpiece. Yeah, I actually... They get a, they have a really good reputation as far as their community goes. They have a very extreme um, um, policy around contribution, which is amazing. Like they just have a, if you make a pull request, it gets accepted, even if it breaks things. There will be just be another pull request. It's like wiki style. Someone else will just have to fix it. Um, it's pretty wild. They, they, I've reduced it down to a very kind of dramatic nub but um like it's worth looking into how they do their development because it's very interesting um chase is saying occasionally i feel like doing uh actually doing something um serious usually something silly involving concurrency primitives yeah I just yeah threading is fun <laughs> yes um Yeah, that's it's a good point, actually, when you're bringing up all the threading stuff. That's the other thing with all these libraries. That's why it ended up being better to for me to do the server side of stuff in Erlang rather than a language I knew better, just because, like, I knew the ecosystem was going to be, have, like, been designed around the characteristics of things being done concurrently because you just don't get away from that in Erlang without really trying. So it's, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Okay, um, right, okay, we've only been going for like an hour 40 so far, but there's not necessarily more 
much more I want to do this episode. This was really what I wanted to get to was just having gone through those two things. So questions, comments, things we could look at, stuff you want to ramble about, shoot it into the chat now. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through what we've got and have a quick think out loud about some of this stuff. But I don't expect to come away with anything, any big kind of revelations right now. It's all stuff that's going to need to just sit in my head for a good few weeks and I'll go for some walks and think about it. Um, also, I'd love any of your opinions, whether you're watching on YouTube or elsewhere and you have a design that's kind of interesting, throw it in, in a comment or in the chat. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, oh, actually, yeah, when it comes to the chat, guys, yeah, just keep going. What, what you're saying at the moment is also super interesting. So I want to hear more. Let's have a look. Okay, so as far as the things we looked at, there is stuff that should be in some kind of setup code. Okay, so there's, there's some top level defined game thing that needs to be to be kind of made um, where we can specify things like the actual settings to the engine and stuff like this. Uh, top level vars containing excuse me, containing um, actors, yeah, do indicate the need for some kind of resource. Because one of the things is if you have, if you have a, um, a regular Lisp global variable, like it's a special variable, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, global, containing uh, one of our instances and then you kill it, Nothing goes and removes it from that variable, so you've got this dead thing in there. I suppose we do have a thing for checking if something's dead, so that's kind of okay. Um, maybe it makes more sense to be able to re like ask for things by name and get them. Um, yeah, we were gonna we were talking about like the named resources stuff. Um, not knowing the screen position, yeah, this came back again and again and again. The screen is something we need to be able to refer to, and we need to be able to. We need to be able to talk about the world. We need to be able to talk about the screen. We need to be able to talk about things relative to that stuff. Um, the screen, by benefit of the camera, definitely has a position. And we can do things relative to that. Um, yeah, the edges and all these things have positions. So we can talk about that stuff. Um, so that matters. The world is a little trickier like does the world have a position not really it's like it does have boundaries um so maybe there's something to that i'm not sure um i'm not sure what to make available there other than if you're in the world or out of the world i do like the idea if, if you're out the world it just dies that kind of feels fine to me but maybe maybe you also need to be able to specify that you just can't leave the world i'm not sure what the behavior is do you like slide across or do you just stop i don't know get just reverted to your old position not really sure about that um system doesn't handle stopping and restarting yeah there's some there's some life cycle stuff there that's just not correct this is the big thing i think the big takeaway is there needs to be some kind of aggregation and we need to be able to talk about things um in terms of their aggregate even if like it would be like swarm of bees if you had a swarm of bees we want to be able to make each bee its own actor um, but we want each bee to know that it's in the swarm. We want to be able to have a number of swarms and have them, be, like maybe they're zipping, like maybe they just, they do their thing, but they always return back to the center of the cloud. So you can have the, the group moving as a thing as well. And I'm not sure if the aggregation can have behavior itself or if the... Um, behavior is always in the actors and they just have to look at the shared information to know what's going on there um, this also kind of plays into the thing of being able to send messages to other entities uh, some kind of inbox there is this again makes me think of Erlang because like w when you have naming in Erlang you can you when you spawn a process um, you can you can give it a name you can register processes in a kind of global registry um and then other things can ask for you by name maybe i just need to go and look at the erlang stuff again and see if i can pour some of that into here there is also a question of making this fast um 
so doing things by like inbox i think it's gonna be the same way we're doing everything else which is everything's double buffered you have an inbox and you just like this is the inbox for the next frame so you push stuff into that and then when we swap that becomes your current inbox and you can read from it so that's interesting um we still don't have a way of querying things by like like a like a, by volume or things like this by everything within this range give me like that um which feels like it's something we could probably do fairly easily also i think the way we're doing collision now is balls so um unless you want you really want to be able to do collisions um by like say have i collided with a specific thing like and for that, we just actually need to get down to it and do some proper collision. Um, the stuff we've been doing so far is pixel perfect and it's done per kind. But we need to just do some like bounding, basic bounding box collision stuff, which, you know, is something we can do. And I think that's most of it. Yeah, those are the big ones then. So there's about two or three. There's the inboxes, there's aggregations. And there's naming. And those are the three things that if we were going to take this further, we need to nail that down. Because these games can't be done without those being addressed. But yeah, that's the um, that's the summary of that, of basically the experiment from last year. I uh, probably should have done it sooner than that, but that's not a problem. But now we get back to chat where the interesting stuff is actually happening. Okay. ba ba, -ba. Let's have a look. Bond of him, yeah, I do like the uh, AI, the uh, the the kind of bot behavior stuff. We should look into that. We should look in that. I'll I'll try and remember to do some reading so we can um, play with something because that would be really fun. Doing like kind of little group mechanics and stuff like this and we should also do an episode on pathfinding as well because although i've done it years ago like it's time to just get that out again and do some stuff um darius is saying by the way talking about threading in cl as in doing stuff that's not in the spec why is there nothing like um srfi for scheme in common list what's srfi Uh, scheme SRFI. Okay, so these are proposals for scheme implementers. We do have that. It's called the CUDA. Oh, no, it's the, um, and nothing has been done from it, um, as, if I remember correctly. Um, was it CUDA? Yes. Um, so yeah, there's a, a few proposals in here. There is actually some... St what was the one thing I wanted from here? Yes, file local variables. Didier come up with this one, and I would just love that to be... Love that to be added. But other than that, um, I was saying none of these have been done. I actually have... That's full of, I'm full of shit. I haven't um, actually checked to see if any of these have been implemented across the board. Um... Initial, final, and I'm just not sure if any of them have actually been, yeah. Some of all know, and they can tell me. But yeah, there isn't really that thing. The spec hasn't changed, and um, I'm kind of fine with that. But there are some things that really hurt. Like, it would be great if there was... I mean, we have a Bordeaux for threading. And so everything does implement that, everything that matters, so... But there is a, there are some there are definitely questions about certain things that happen and order and things like this that become very difficult. Um, yeah. Um, oh yeah, Jace is saying this is actually it was way ahead of me. I should really read this before I start answering things. Jason's saying there are a few things like that, but none of them are really taking them off. 
um, because there's no actual way to update the spec itself without loads of new money for a spec, kid is saying. Yeah, it's like there's, um, people don't fundamentally want to change spec. And I do, I, I really sympathize with that, to be honest. Um, the things that come up, when people say about modernizing fucking common list, it makes me so sad because it's always like, everything should be generic methods and oh yeah we should just really net, like double down on the object oriented stuff and all that kind of thing and i would i would i would just quit using common lisp if that was the case i would just fuck that um so yeah to be honest i like the fact that it hasn't changed because it just has insulated the language against bad growth but also there are some things that could really help to have in there which again like being able to rely on threading for example would be really nice and um yeah, there are definitely, there's a lot of, there, there are places in the language that are underspecified. It'd be nice to have those kind of shored up a bit. Um, and some of it's just that, like, yeah, that was the design of the language. Like, there were reasons that made a lot, that made a lot of sense then. Um, Yeah, kid, I, I, I was still rambling about the uh, stuff that we were doing in the stream at that point. Um, at 9.46 when I was busy rambling. Um, yeah. And there there is a nice thing again about, like, Common Lisp hasn't needed it as much as, like, Scheme, Scheme, obviously, it's great that they have it and all that kind of stuff. And Scheme has the same advantage that Common Lisp has over some languages. So they, like, Java, if you wanted disposables in Java, for example, which they're probably in now, but whatever. If you wanted that in, um, if you wanted a syntactic abstraction in Java, you can't add it yourself. Um, and not in a portable way, not in a way you could give to other people. But if we want a syntactic abstraction, we write a macro and it's done. So there are a load of things we haven't needed to extend the spec for. And again, macros are why we've been able to get away with that. But yes, there's plenty of cases which are, which are tough. Um... Yes, but yeah, the um, so then Jace is saying, yeah, the best we've been able to pull off so far is just like we've got compatibility libraries and everyone just kind of tries to keep them in line and stuff like that. But yes, it's um, there are details where that stuff really matters and it's kind of painful. Um, Harris is saying, sadly, not all of the portability libraries are well specified, 100% true, since those mostly shim over what was already there when the library was made, absolutely true, yeah. Like, uh, I, I can, rather than name and shame anyone else, is I can just say, like, I have the trivial, what was it? Trivial macro expand all um, is a library I made, which is just calls out to the various implementations of macro expand all that you find in different things, and they're not exactly the same. So you get, like, especially with the handling of environment. So yes, they're not, it's not the same as if it was written into the spec. But yeah, um... Jason was saying quite a few of those are implemented across the board. They were just mostly already implemented in most cases before CUDA came around. Really? Okay, that's actually good. So quite a few of those are implemented already. Huh. I really wish the file local variables one had. <laughs> it is good that the spec doesn't change. We don't have the Python 2. But I had the Python... <sighs> yeah. I think with a lot of that stuff, it's blown out of proportion. I mean, like, yes, there's a big split in the community and the Python stuff, but like, it doesn't feel like it's something that won't work itself out or is just... I mean, it's messy, but Python still has an amazing ecosystem. So it's like, it's so bad that they've got two things with an amazing ecosystem. How sad for them. I would be quite happy for Common Lisp to have one of those ecosystems. Um, yeah, what would you use if you had to quit Common Lisp? God knows, man. I actually don't know. I would, again, I would probably want to like now i've done this for a while <sighs> yeah i'd probably look into something more experimental than low level i mean yeah i, I see i see i still want the live coding but i just want to be able to keep things like i i just I, man yeah no, that's a that's a stressful possibility but there are lots of things in common list which we don't have which would be really nice again like i'll 
yeah, I kind of, sorry, my brain's going off on the different kind of language implementation things, but they don't necessarily fit with Common Lisp's goals. So they don't really make sense to say, oh, Common Lisp would be better with this because they're not an actual fit. Um, but there are lots of, lots of interesting, to be honest, I just want better ways to join languages together as well. Um, but I, I just love SBCL. So I probably, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'd probably look at one of the other kind of low level lisps like Bone or something like this and see what I could do in there. But still for scripting, Common Lisp is awesome. So I really love the idea of just having a high level language that uses your environment for coding lower level things. So basically rather than having an IDE with just, I hope the right number of tools, you have a programming environment and then the programming language you're actually interested in inside. And you use the high level language as a tooling system for the lower level language, which I mean is what we kind of get with Common Lisp to agree anyway, like especially if you're doing VOPs and things. I'm kind of rambling there. I'm not sure that last couple of sentences made any sense, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think it would be a good idea to change the spec or write a new version. Having a consistent spec is a huge plus. Yeah, it's just, it's the things that come up first when people talk about changing the spec or just depress me. But Common Lisp was definitely due with some things being in there. Median saying, this looks interesting for parallel stuff. L parallel. God, oh, I've put L parallel in a while. Let's have a look. Let's bring that up. And I'm just going to get through the rest of chat. Oh, we're all, oh, Jesus, we're almost done. Um, yeah, you're right, kid. Like, again, a spec obviously helps. There's good value to it, but um, yeah. Do, do, do. Parallel programming system for common lisp. Yes. James Lawrence. I remember him. Yeah, that's interesting. Been a while since the last update, so I hope it's fairly stable. Hey, Jess John. Awesome. Good chat. All right. Oh, I'll have to dig into that another time. It's, it is cool, but... Ah, oh, so many things. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's actually a good few uh, different implementations. Marco... What's his name? Marco Heisig, he's done a couple of talks at um, ELS over the past couple of like times. Um, their stuff, where they're using Common Lisp for kind of super supercomputer stuff, is very interesting. Um, yeah, that's fun. Actually, yeah, um, are any of you going to ELS this year? Because I'm, I have booked my tickets. I've booked my hotel. I will be there um, down in Italy for a couple of days at the beginning of April. So if any of you there, it'd be awesome to meet up with you. I know that. Um, Shimera is going to be there, and so I'm uh, just thinking of who's publicly said they're heading down there. But yeah, I, I won't. I don't want to mess up who's saying where they're going or not. But it will be lovely to see you all. Um, got conversations on USocket, which I've only used a little bit so far. Um, that was when I was, I was making a little um, an app that you could. It was an Android app where you had a bunch of sliders and pads and things like this, and then it would send packets over to a common list program, and you could use it as a tool for fiddling with values. So it was like a inspector kind of thing. So um, CFFI is awesome. I love it. It is one of the better FFIs I've ever seen. Um, just saying, it was really go close to going this year. It didn't quite work out. Ah, oh, it's a shame, man. It is taking place in um, Genoa, Genoa. I'm not sure which one. I see both names. I don't know what the one the locals actually say. Um, cool. 
All right, folks, I am I am feeling a lack of coffee right now, so I am going to head off because it is 10. Thank you so much for coming down and making this a lot more fun than uh, it would otherwise be, just reading a load of code. Um, next time, I'm not sure what we're going to do next time. It really depends on what happens over the next week. So I will, I will go and think about some of this stuff. Um, if some of you want to do the same, that would be really cool. I'd love to hear your kind of interpretations of what we could do for some of these issues. Um, if I come up with some stuff that feels promising, um, then we'll go into that. Um, there's lots of things we can still think about, kind of um, collision systems and the uh, stuff that Pontypin was talking about earlier for doing some of the AI type stuff. Um, some of the crowd dynamic stuff will be really fun. Um, what else? I really want to start doing some of the compiler passes soon. So that um, that uh, stuff I was showing right at the beginning, there's a, there's a load of optimization stuff that we can do and we can start doing some of that on stream and I would love to do that. Um, and other than that, thanks again. Um, thanks to all the people on Patreon who have been supporting, um, keeping me caffeinated while I do this stuff over the weekend. It was really nice of you. It's completely unnecessary and I love it. Um, the um, I found out why when I paused it last time that it restarted itself, because it's done it again this time, is that when I pause it, it starts itself again at the beginning, the second of the next month. So it's a bit of a weird system. Um, but anyway, I, I was glad to pause it for a bit. I was meant to have paused it over Christmas, which is why I paused it again more recently. But we are back up and running again. Um, thanks so much, and I will catch you all next time. Peace.